And as we'll see with some of the epidemiological data, is the cause of a lot of morbidity and mortality in, in patients. There are clear signs that certain access types and certain access uh, practices influence patient outcomes. And there is a role for all of us to work together because majority of our patients have been in CKD clinics, medicine clinics, diabetics, hypertensives, and have had multiple procedures, multiple hospital admissions prior to initiation of dialysis. And the path that they take to get to ESRD can influence the type of access that they may get, and, and that would in turn influence their outcomes on dialysis. So I put so together some objectives to try and understand dialysis access and ESRD care and, and what is the role, uh, to try and understand the different clinical outcomes that we see with different access. So I'll, I'll try and go over some of the data from uh, uh, a body called USRDS, uh, United States uh, Renal uh, what is it called? Depository System? Data system. Yeah, data system. And, and they maintain a database uh, for all ESRD patients in U.S. And, and they can easily do that because Medicare pretty much pays for all ESRD care in the United States. And then finally, I'll, I'll finish my talk with some of the ways that we could team up to improve access outcomes in our patients. So the, the incidence of ESRD has increased everywhere. And, and if you look at the countries in red, uh, which have more than 250 ESRD patients per million population, uh, United States is, is amongst some of the other leading countries with, with very high incidence. <coughs> Japan, and, and some of the other South Asian countries are, are, are also part of that high uh, incidence of, of ESRD. And over the years, we've, we've seen a, a, a staggering growth in ESRD patient population. And, and the CKD population over those years have, has kind of stayed pretty stable. Maybe a little trend that the CKD3 has gotten a little higher in, in the more recent years. But overall, the CKD population has not really changed. But, but the ESRD population, especially the prevalent patient on dialysis, has continued to increase. So what, what's the difference between CKD and ESRD? So, oh, sorry. Uh, so CKD is one to five stage who are not on dialysis. So this would be a GFR of anywhere between 15 to normal 120. So CKD1 is GFR of more than 90. And this patient would have just proteinuria to classify him as CKD, whereas a 3 patient would have a 30 to 60 GFR, which gets him into the category 3. If you look at United States, there is a, a wide variability in in the incidence population with the darker areas representing much higher concentration, more than 400 patients per million. Remember, United States overall is about 250 or more than 250. But within the United States, we have areas with more than 400. And for those of you who are trying to find Shreveport here, uh, we can enlarge it and look at Shreveport right there. It, and this is part of uh, what we call the Network 13 area. And Shreveport accounts for more than 400 per million per year in terms of incidence of ESRD. So we are amongst one of the highest new ESRD patient population that, that is being added every year. If you break down this incident population, another staggering fact that comes out is Majority of the patients that are starting dialysis these days 
or elderly patients. If you further break down that rate of 400 and you look at patients who are above 75 years of age, the 75 age population, the rate is four times that average of 400. So the new patients that are starting dialysis are elderly and, and they have a much higher morbidity at the initiation of dialysis. So that's another way by which the demographics of ESRD has changed over the years. The good news is that the incidence, the overall incidence of ESRD plateaued or started declining since 2010. So 2010, 2011, we started seeing for the first time the incidence which was going up and then became stagnant for a while started coming down. So perhaps some of the interventions that we have used, blood pressure, diabetes, weight, have made some influence in, in reducing that very high incidence. But I think when you look at the total prevalent population, the, the figures look really grim. And, and we are up to about 650 plus thousand all ESRD patients, out of which about 450,000 patients are on hemodialysis. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge population which continues to rise and the prevalence increases as we are able to provide a longer longevity to the ESRD patients. Even though we are adding less numbers, the total numbers continue to grow. So nephrology is growing and, and that's a maybe a welcome sign for the residents to look into nephrology because ASN has projected that there will be a 76% increase in the, in the nephrology FTE. And, and if you judge by the, the recent drop in the nephrology applicants, you know, we may see a sudden uh, increased demand in nephrology over the next coming years. Another fact which is very important to realize is if you compare ESRD outcomes with patients who are of the same age but do not have ESRD diagnosis, whether they are 20 years of age or less, 20 to 44 years of age, if you look at the general medicine patient and his mortality is say 11 per thousand patient years, the ESRD mortality is 70. When you go up to the more elderly patient population, the difference becomes severely staggering. No matter which way you look at, pretty much across the board, there's a 600% increase mortality in patients who are on dialysis versus equivalent age Medicare patients who are not on dialysis. So this mortality over the years, we've kind of looked at modalities of dialysis and, and early in the 90s, peritoneal dialysis was associated with a little higher mortality and was not really the, the modality of choice by a lot of nephrologists. But in the more recent years, we pretty much have seen equal outcomes with both home PD therapy and hemodialysis. And that's an important concept to just keep in the back of the head that overall, at least in the first few years of dialysis, there is no difference in outcomes between hemodialysis and PD patients. But if you break down the outcomes within the first year of dialysis, what, what happens to these patients after they start dialysis? For patients who are less than 65, they do have a higher mortality if they initiated hemodialysis, especially in the first two, three months. And it can't, starts to come down. Whereas the patients on PD may do a little better. But when you look at patients who are above 65, and remember, majority of the patients that we are starting dialysis are 65 and 75 years of age. The mortality is 
very high in the first few months of dialysis. And I think that's been one of the challenges to how do we control that and, and what interventions are available to us to, to make that better. So with that background, yes. Go back to that slide. I don't know that that's not the right thing to do. Is that more stable patients go on TV. Right. So there is a, a what Dr. Blathen points out is that somebody who is capable and able to care for himself is the one who's going to start PD. So you're going to have a selection bias with PD. But having said that, some of our very sick patients, uh, including one of the patients that we had in ICU here, who's uh, incapable of doing hemodialysis because of a very sick heart can also benefit from doing PD because of the, the regular daily UF that you get with PD versus the intermittent rapid UF that you get with hemodialysis. And hemodynamically, it, it tends to be a little easier on the heart. So in patients with sick hearts, you could possibly use PD as an option. But majority of the patients who are starting PD tend to be healthier because they are involved and, and actively participating in the care versus those who are sick nursing home patients who have been taken to the dialysis unit for dialysis. So with that background, I'm going to introduce you to the three common form of dialysis access. And I'm sure you've all seen patients with a dialysis fistula, which is a, a connection between any artery and a vein provided the vein is superficial enough that I can cannulate that vein and get about four to 500 ml of blood to circulate through the dialysis machine and, and clean it in the, for the duration of dialysis. It's supposedly the best, best way to do dialysis because it has the lowest infection rate and does not fail easily compared to some of the other options that we have. But the drawback is that they do have a very high failure rate. So if I convince my patient to go through the surgery, which they don't want to because of cosmetic issues, you don't want a scar on your hand. They've seen these big bulging fistulae in, in other patients, and they're scared of about that. And, and you get them into surgery, we see a, a staggering primary failure rate with AV fistula. At our institution, it, it has been as high as 50% at times, maybe even higher in certain patient population. And, and as a community overall, we have struggled with getting those numbers up higher. And there perhaps is a, is, is a skill issue. Uh, surgeons uh, in, in certain parts of the country there's a surgeon in Baton Rouge. His success rate is almost 90%. There's another guy in uh, Oklahoma. He has a 97% fistula success rate. And then we have areas where the failure rate is as high as 70%. So if you place three axes, only one of them is going to work. So that's a challenge. So in those patients where there is not a good vein for a fistula, we choose to put a synthetic Gotex graft, which is a synthetic polymer. It's meshed together into a little tube, and, and that tube is hooked onto an artery and a vein outflow. And now you could puncture that tube to, to get the blood that is required to run on the machine. Very high risk of thrombosis, almost at least one thrombosis, if not 1.5 every year. That's a big problem with these, so they get thrombosed and then they come back to us for intervention. And there is some degree of infection risk in these. And then the last, in terms of outcomes, is the tunnel dialysis catheter. The big advantage, I can place a tunnel dialysis catheter and start the patient on dialysis within the next hour. But it has a high infection risk and a high risk of dysfunction and is associated with a lot of 
long term central vein thrombosis, central vein uh, infections, atrial thrombosis, and overall the outcomes are, are not as good. So we will review some of the differences in these. So with that background in, in the three different types of access, what are our patients getting when they're starting dialysis? So if you look at data for the last 10 years, the green line suggests that 60% of the patients who are starting dialysis are starting with a catheter only. The last option that I showed you, 6 out of 10 start with a catheter. About 2 out of 10 start with a fistula, so 20%. And other 2 out of 10 start with a fistula that is not mature yet, so it's not big enough, able enough to run dialysis. So they require a catheter to run them on dialysis for that period that the fistula is not mature. So overall, 8 out of 10 patients in the first day, first month of dialysis are, are using a catheter. And that has consequences. <laughs> In one of the reviews from Fresenius database, now Fresenius and Davida are two big, what we call LDOs or, or large dialysis organizations. Uh, they, between them, have about 90% of the total 450,000 ESRD patients that, that, we, that we have on dialysis. And the Fresenius database, they looked at about 80,000 patients that have started dialysis and, and compared the outcomes in the first year in patients who had fistula versus a graft versus a catheter, no matter how we look at it, we adjust it for labs, the patient mix, there's almost a twofold increased risk of death, a twofold increased risk of death within the first year if you started with a catheter. Now, having said that, there is still you need to consider that certain patients are just so sick that the surgeons are not going to place a fistula on them. They are not candidates to go undergo a graft placement. So there is a bias towards pushing the poor surgical candidate, the poor physical state patients into catheters, and, and maybe that explains the high outcomes that we see. In another study from Canada, Dr. Pearl looked at patient outcomes again in the first year, second, third, fourth, fifth year. And when the red line, which is the catheter outcomes, again showed compared to patients who are doing fistulas, almost a twofold increase in mortality. But they showed that if you did PD, PD was not as bad as doing dialysis with a catheter. And, and that is another kind of message that we've started looking at to see how can we incorporate PD, which may have less first year mortality, less first two, three year mortality as compared to starting a patient with a tunnel dialysis catheter. So how are we doing, again, in terms of our areas when we are starting patients on dialysis, the, the darker you are, the more catheters you are using for dialysis. These are incident patients who are starting dialysis. We look at Shreveport, we are doing fairly good. We are starting less than half our patients with a catheter only compared to overall in the country, which is about 80%. So that's good. And I think a lot of credit goes to our CKD clinic here because we do take care of a lot of indigent patient population who does not have any insurance before they start dialysis. And they have no choice but to follow at LSU CKD clinic because the private guys would not see them and they cannot follow with those private nephrologists. They initiate here, and at times they will 
move to some of the prior practices after they start initiation, you know, start dialysis at LSU. When we look at the percentage officially used at the start of dialysis, again, Shreveport is doing about, because we have less catheters, we are actually using about 40%, 40, 45% officially, which is, again, a good sign compared to some of the other neighboring areas around us. It's Baton Rouge, which has a very high, and I told you that some of those outcomes may be surgeon dependent because you need good fissionally outcome to be able to use them for dialysis. But when we look at our prevalent hemodialysis population, again, we see a lot of dark gray here, which is the areas which have very high fissionally, but it seems like the southeast is not doing as well and may have less than 57% fissionally. We look at Shreveport, we have one of the lowest prevalent fissile in our population. So even though we are starting with a lot of fissile, for some reason we've not been able to get more patients off the catheters once they start and get them officially. Could that be because these patients are sicker and, and are not capable of getting a fissile? Uh, I don't know what the reasons are, but there are multiple factors that could explain that, that, that finding. So I showed earlier that the mortality is really high. And there are signals from various studies that the mortality is, is very likely associated with a very high rate of bacteremia that you see in patients with temporary catheters or permacats. So if you look at the patients with catheter, their sepsis-free survival is much less compared to the fish leg. Uh, if you look at the first year of outcomes. So the mortality is predominantly an infectious mortality, and, and uh, that is something that, that could be reversible. So if we summarize what we talked about, we, we see a very high prevalence of ESRD. We see a, a very variable trend for dialysis access across the country with wide variations in practice. We see that there is a lower mortality with fistula use. Hemodialysis with a catheter may have a higher mortality within the first year of dialysis. And, and catheters may have a very high rate of infections in the first year of dialysis. And this also translates to very high cost in care as well. When you take hemodialysis patients, the cost is about $85,000, $90,000 a year compared to the PD patients, which are a little less, maybe about $70,000 per year. So when you look at the difference of $20,000, and we only have about 6% of the total prevalent population on PD, if you can increase that number, that could be a huge saving to the system as well. And then the best outcomes are with transplant, where the cost of care is, is much less. But then eligibility for transplant is what precludes a lot of patients from getting a transplant. The overall expenditure continues to grow. We're up to about close to $40 billion with total ESRD expenditure uh, over a year. And, and some of that is coming with these infected catheters. The average length of stay is long. The average cost is really high per incident of infection. And when you put it all together, there are several studies that show that one in three of them will get infected within three months. So you put a catheter and you send them out for dialysis one in three will come back with bacteremia and sepsis within three months. Within six months, half of them will be infected. And within a year, almost certain that all of them will get infected. And what is sometimes amazing is that we, we have some patients who've had a catheter for 
years and, and they do not get any infection. So that's surprising. There's a patient who's got breast cancer who's on my dialysis ship. She's been on dialysis seven years. For the last five years, she's had the same catheter and, and she's never had a problem. So, it, so there are some, some things that we just don't know about. And, and there is also a, a trend that some of these catheter related infections are coming from the dialysis units in terms of the personal hygiene and the, and, and the protective uh, care that is taken at the time of starting patients on dialysis because most of these infections are coming endoluminal uh, when, when there is a tunnel catheter. They're not extra luminal infection because they have a cuff which prevents any cath uh, extra luminal infection to go into the patient. Patients who are on home hemodialysis, and that's a very small number of patients in the United States, have a much lower risk of catheter infections compared to patients who are on in-center hemodialysis. So infection in, in ESRD patients has become a huge focus for CMS and, and CMS just partnered with ASN to come up with ways to monitor and ensure that we have ways or means in pace which are the best practices that we have seen in certain units where the infection rates are really low and see if we can put them in other units where the infection rates are really high to try and get this number down. So I, I should have convinced you by now that catheters are the cause of maybe doubling the mortality in my dialysis patient within a year. So what can I do to prevent that? And there are a few different options that we have now. There are these early cannulation graphs available now. Normally, if you put a, a dialysis graft, it would take about four to six weeks before the graft could be used for dialysis. But there are these early cannulation grafts that are available, which can be cannulated hours after placement. So you could start the patient on dialysis the same day after they get that graft. Well, what you need is you need a, a surgeon who is willing to work with you and, and get these patients in on that short time and maybe you will have to do acute short-term dialysis to optimize these patients volume electrolytes so that they are able to get to surgery and get that graft placed and, and over the time we've done a few of those here Dr. Tan uh, who left LSU was, was really enthusiastic about doing some of these AccuSeal grafts and we had several patients that we prevented a catheter by, by using this approach Another approach that we've used is, is urgent start PD, uh, where we've seen that the PD outcomes in the first year are fairly comparable to the fistula outcomes with low mortalities and no morbidities. So if I put this patient on PD instead of the tunnel dialysis hemocatheter, I may be able to decrease their first year risk. And, and that is a, an approach which has been used in, in a lot of different centers in, in United States lately and it, it is gaining grounds. Also for economic reasons because PD is, is a much profitable option for the LDOs so they are always supportive of, of the physicians trying to push the PD populations up and, and encourage and, and there is a win-win for the physicians because you, you have a lower mortality for the patients. Not every patient is eligible for PD so you should have a, a good screening tool available to make sure that the patients would be able to comply with the needs of PD at home. You also need a dedicated room a facility where you can do urgent start PD because you have to have the patients go to the outpatient dialysis centers on a daily basis or every other day basis and, and do PD in a supine position so that the intra-abdominal pressures are low. And then of course you need the willing patient who will be ready to take that care and, and, and make sure that, that you're able to, to do the, the required you know, two, three weeks of, of training and invest in their care. And that is usually the part that where we struggle the most. 
He's absolutely straight. Why is he smiling? Because he's a happy patient. Oh, he's Urema. <laughs> so what can we do together? What other means besides the catheter last approach, which is left up to the nephrologist? I think the key is to have a vascular access plan, not at the time of initiating dialysis, but probably to look at that vascular access plan way before when the patient is a diabetic and then you see that the patient has proteinuria and his creatinine is about a 1.2 now and the GFR is about 45, 50, 55 and, and get those patients to have certain things in place so that they will have a more likelihood of getting an access in future. So what are the things that we could do? You know, we need to have that organized approach and I think that's really important. And like I said, these patients are, are coming into clinics, into hospitals, they're getting admitted multiple times, and all of those are opportunities where the limited number of possible venous options are being butchered with, with the number of IVs that they get. So what can we do? What, what does a plan involve? I think it does involve, first and foremost, is vein preservation. And I think that is such an important tool that sometimes is, is neglected, but does require a team approach from everybody who has, who participates in, in, in a patient's care and, and improve that. Patients' education is important, letting the patients know about the importance of access and associated mortality will help the patient dictate their own care. If they know that my left hand, which is my non-dominant hand, is going to be my potential AV, AV fistula lifeline, they would tell those nurses not to put an AV, uh, IV in that anti-cubital fossa. You should draw the blood from the dorsal surface of the hand and, and prevent any IV sticks and IV uh, access in the, in the front of the hand. We need to keep pushing for that hemodialysis catheter is the evil and, and not really the, the best choice that you could have. At the appropriate time, venous mapping, and that is something that, that, that the nephrologist will get involved with. and, and and at some appropriate time, we should get the nephrology involved. What is that appropriate time is up to debate because the number of consoles that we get keeps growing ever so, so high. Uh, perhaps 30 or 45 ml of, of GFR is, is when we need to have some degree of involvement with the nephrologist so that they can also start working on those ways to ensure that the patients are aware of, of what their options are. So saving the non-dominant arm, and the non-dominant because the, the patients on the dialysis machine can, can utilize the dominant ions to, to still be functional. So no blood pressure measurements, no IVs, no blood draws on that hand. And, and that's the golden line that, that comes up. Place vascular access within a year of hemodialysis anticipation. How do we know when the patient needs dialysis has been one of the biggest problems that we've had. We've had some patients in our CKD clinic who've had an AV fistula for four years. And the fistula keeps getting bigger by the year, but the GFR stays stable. There was an interesting study recently which suggested that when you place fistula, and you compared patients who had a fistula place versus those who didn't have a fistula, the GFR actually got better after the fistula was placed. And that's, that's staggering. And, and there are some explanations that hemodynamically, your blood pressures get better when you place a fistula. So perhaps that's playing a role. One of the treatments for hypertension has been suggested to do a fem-fem fistula. You do a fem-fem fistula, you decrease the peripheral vascular resistance, and the blood pressures go down. So we really don't know. And, and having that crystal ball to predict the outcomes is difficult. But there are certain signs. Patients who have very high proteinuria. In the clinic and, and using EPIC, you can very easily graph the GFR change. And if my GFR change is 6 ml 
every year versus one ml every year, I know what the outcomes would be on that patient. You cannot predict the acute drop in GFRs, but we should be able to predict the chronic trend that the patient is taking before they'll end up on, on ESRD care. So vein preservation is really important and, and does have long-term effects, not only in that patient's outcome, but, but overall cost saving to the entire system. Pick lines have become pretty much like candies in the hospital. You know, you go to Willis Line, there is no patient without a pick line. It's amazing. The moment the patients get in the hospital, the pick team is there to get the pick line. And, and, and they're causing vein injury by direct foreign body effect. Because any foreign body in, in a vein is, is not welcome, and the body will try and sclerose it off. That's the, that's the natural response. It causes inflammation with neointimal hyperplasia. There's a lot of turbulent blood flow, which increases blood clot around those veins. And then these patients have uremia, and, and like I said, they, the veins will eventually sclerose off. The most viable veins that are used for AV fistula are the cephalic vein with the radiocephalic fistula, the cephalic vein in the upper arm with the brachiocephalic or the proximal radiocephalic fistula, or the basilic vein fistula. And guess what? These are the veins where we put the pick lines. So the pick line goes into the cephalic vein, and the cephalic vein is dead, and you cannot use that for dialysis anymore. You put the pick line in the basilic, now that's gone. So no more fistula for this patient. The only thing he can get is a graft. And we know that the grafts just don't work as long and as well as a fistula. There are alternatives to pick line. And we've been doing it at our institution for a long time. Uh, there are multiple names of these catheters, the Hickman or the Broviac. So that's a pick line which goes through this big vein and, and is pretty much going to ensure that the entire vein is going to clot off. It could be in the midline catheter where it goes through the, the brachial vein and even that is bad because it sclerose off not the peripheral vein but also the central veins. And sometimes some, some practitioners would put these pick lines or, or the Hickmans through the subclavian vein which is absolutely a no-no in an ESRD patient or a CKD patient because subclavian is the common inflow from all peripheral venous return. So if you kill the subclavian vein and the subclavian vein gets sclerosed, you cannot have any fistula in that peripheral hand now because the moment you put an axis in that hand, the venous pressures will get so high, there will be arm swelling and that axis is not going to run. So both of these are, are not good options. In our patients, the best option would be a tunneled catheter, single lumen, double lumen, Broviac, Hickman, that, that should go into the IJ and from the IJ into the superior vena cava so you do not impinge on any of those central vessels which are the vital conduit to get blood back to the heart. And, and leave the possible options for a peripheral fistula in future. Neointimal hyperplasia is an inflammatory condition that is very common in CKD. Whether you look at the coronaries, and these are coronaries from patients with different degrees of CKD, as the CKD, which is very mild, goes up to higher grades, you can see that the luminal diameters in the coronary arteries drops. You look at the veins, you see severe degree of neointimal hyperplasia in some of these patients at the time of fistula creation. So the, the veins have a lot of negative to even begin with, so the outcomes are, are difficult in, in these patients at times. Nursing education is also a vital part where getting the, the nurses to be involved and and, and aware of the options available for those CKD patients is important. National Kidney Foundation passes out these badges that the patients can have and, and sometimes we've used those in our patients to try and identify patients who have 
potential for an AV fish line future, and you protect that arm from any of those uh, uh, insults that, that may occur in the hospital. And the second thing we can do is, is, is maintain existing fish lists. So we need to create more fish lists so you can increase the incident rates. But you also need to try and identify dysfunction in already established fish lists and be able to pick up patients who have some disease and see if we can intervene on, that, on them better. So with that, I'm just going to spend the last 10 minutes introducing you to a very basic physical exam of an AV fistula, a physical exam that I call IBO, inflow, body, outflow. Three things, you should be able to do this exam in less than five minutes in any patient with a fistula. And it gives you a lot of information about whether that access is working right or not. So inflow, body, outflow. The inflow of any fistula should have an anastomosis between the artery and the vein, and it doesn't matter which vein, as long as the vein is superficial, you should be able to use that for dialysis. The vein should be within six or five millimeters of the surface of the skin, because anything deeper than that becomes too deep for the vein cannulation on dialysis. So when you feel the pulse on the fistula, you should be able to identify where the anastomosis is with a scar around that area. Because the surgeons have to cut down, go to the artery, and anastomose the artery and the vein. So you see the scar, that's your anastomosis. If you just go a little proximal to the scar and feel the pulse, you should be able to feel a soft pulse. When you listen to the pulse, that area, you should see a continuous brewing that goes both in systole and diastole. Both in diastole and systole, there is continuous flow of blood, which tells you that this is a low resistance circuit, and the outflow does not have significant resistance, which is normal for an AV fistula. The veins have very low resistance. So that's a normal fistula auscultation. We can also check for adequate inflow by doing a simple test where if you occlude on the fistula and you prevent the outflow of the vein, the, the fistula should become, the pulse should become really strong. Because what you've done is you've created a fistula to an end circuit now where the arterial pressures are directly transmitted to your hand and you'll be able to feel that strong arterial bounding pulse directly at that place. And if you feel that, that means the inflow is good. Whereas if you don't, and, and there is a very poor thrill, and the fistula does not dilate, and you do not feel the strong pulse, that tells you that there is a poor inflow. So a very simple test tells you about inflow in about two minutes. And juxta anastomotic stenosis is a term used, and we see that in almost 50% of the patients who get a new fistula have that problem, and the fistula does not mature or a fistula that is mature fails because of that lesion. And it's a very simple uh, fix, which you could fix in the, in the lab by, by uh, balloon angioplasty. The body of the fistula, again, the same simple palpation. You should feel the entire body to be soft and a continuous thrill when you raise the arm up because of the sudden increase in gravity the fistula should become smaller. The body becomes softer, and the, the diameter of that body becomes less. So when you have the arm laying down, the fistula is filled and, and nice, full-bodied. But when you raise the arm up, the fistula should get softer. So simple test that tells you that there is no outflow. If there is a stenosis in the fistula in the mid-body somewhere, when you raise the arm up, the distal part of the fistula will stay full, and that stenosis will prevent the fistula from collapsing and becoming softer, and you'll be able to make a diagnosis of a stenosis there. When you listen to the stenosis, you hear a strong pitch sound at the site of stenosis, and it's telling you that the velocity of blood flow 
has suddenly increased in that area, and that high velocity flow suggests that there is a stenosis, and we need to intervene to prevent that fistula from failing. So a high velocity, high pitch sound suggests a possible stenosis in that axis. The outflow is the last part of the exam. Again, the same principle for the outflow, that if the outflow is diseased and there is some stenosis in the outflow anywhere, the fistula will be bounding, will have a, a severe pulsatile flow to it. The, the brewery on, on exam would be predominantly systolic, and the flow in diastole would be really very scant. And that should suggest that there is a problem. When you do a simple exam, the hand may be severely uh, swollen. And we see that a lot commonly in, in, in a simple angioplasty of the central veins in this patient should help decrease the pressures and get that swelling down. So with that, I'm going to come to the end. So hemodialysis catheters equal high mortality and high morbidity and probably a high cost as well. We need to do everything we can to have a fistula first and a catheter last, and maybe graph somewhere in between. We need to have a, a plan to make sure that the patients and the patient's caregivers understand the, the importance of simple access uh, procedure that, that they would take and, and the outcomes that, that come with that. So if there is a patient who does not have a tunnel dial, who does not have an AV fistula at the initiation of dialysis, maybe we need to look at other options. Can he get a graft? Will he be able to get PD? And if none of those work, maybe we need to start him with a tunnel dialysis catheter then. And, and then probably try and push for getting that catheter out ASAP. Because there is no other therapy that would decrease the risk of death within the first year by as much as 60 to 70, 80 percent as just simply taking that catheter out and getting a fish line in that patient well. And that's where the surgery team and, and, and having everybody together to work towards that is the goal. We need to get these patients into the nephrology clinic at a decent time. Vein preservation should start early, maybe at 45 ml GFR in some of the patients. And, and definitely big lines should be avoided and, and uh, do have a very high cost on the long-term outcomes of these patients. So with that, I'm going to stop and take any questions. Are, are the, the techniques for fistula examination, will they work for graft examination? They will not, because the graft is a synthetic tube. Uh, it does not dilate or, or is not able to give you the same uh, uh, findings on, on palpation, but when you auscultate, it should be able to give you the same findings on auscultation with a high pitch velocity or a high velocity flow versus a, a, a normal velocity. Any questions? Yes. Uh, dialysis adequacy in a Some of the veins that will sclerose off do recanalize after some time. Um, the tunnel dialysis catheter, we, we do see a, a huge risk of thrombus in those patients in the right IJ after they've been there for sometimes as, as short as a week. And within a week, there is a thrombus and the IJ occlusion. And if you take them out, some of those veins will recanalize after some time, but some may, some will not. The adequacy is another huge difference between catheter versus the fistula. I'm talking about the hemodialysis adequacy. The, the blood flow rates that we get with the catheters are, are, are lower. So the clearance 
uh, the patients get on dialysis is lower and could be one of the explanations why the mortality is high because these patients may not be getting good adequate middle molecule clearance as the fish law may be provided. So yeah, I think a similar thing uh, collateral so the thing, those and they do, and, and at times with central stenosis, you see a huge mesh of collaterals, sometimes centrally. It's just that the blood flow requirements for the dialysis axis are, are in tune of half a liter of blood a minute. And at times, with that much flow and the pressure, the arm swelling becomes a huge problem. And if you're not able to decrease those pressures in that, act, in that extremity, that, that arm swelling could be really debilitating. How much time typically takes after the surgery, the fistula is? Uh, so once the surgery is done and, and you have absolutely no problems, uh, different countries have shown different times before they've used fistulas. In, in US, it's typically about as much as 12 weeks, minimum six weeks. In Japan, they've shown that they could use those fistulas in four weeks. But typically in Japan, they use blood flow rates of 200s, whereas in, in US, the average blood flow rate is about 300, 350. Is any, racial Any racial differences? The outcomes in African American patients are not as good as Caucasians. Females tend to fail fistulas more than and males. Diabetics don't develop fistulas as well. Old age is a big negative factor for fistula development. So, all of those are, are the patients that we are actually adding up more into the, into the patient mix that we have. All right. Well, thank you, everybody.